thanks, Chris, uh, so much for for talking to us and helping us out. I I can't wait to see this movie. Um, but before seeing it, I read that you ate seven thousand calories per day to play George Foreman, mm-hmm. and I gotta say that sounds fun. Um, if if I do that too, what side effects can I expect? It sounds fun. <laughs> it sounds fun. Seven thousand calories a day sounds fun. Okay, let me ask you, what do you think you would eat? If you had to eat 7,000 calories a day, what would you choose? Yeah, I don't think I don't think I could do it. I think we're tripping into like milkshake overload, right? So that you could just sort of consume it quietly as yeah. you go about your day and then end of day, you're like, yeah. oh my God, what did I do? But how, how did yeah, you yeah. manage to get it done? Uh, I did it in a, on a pescatarian diet. I um, uh, didn't do any dairy, didn't do any sugar. Um, I wanted to do it all clean because I had to gain so much weight in such a quick amount of time. And I wanted it to, to go off, off as quickly as it came on, you know, so I didn't want the sugars and things like this. I didn't want the the, the dairy to add that extra weight that's hard to get rid of. So I did it all clean, you know, and I and I gained uh, 50 pounds in five weeks, you know, went from 225 to 275 in five weeks. And when you eat that much food, what you can expect is you see stars i mean literal stars it feels like your eyes are going to burst out of your head and then you fall asleep and then you wake up and then all you could, you have to eat again and then you start to see stars and then you fall asleep and this happens for about the first week um and then after that you're essentially shoveling forcing the food down into your stomach there's no way to chew the food at a certain point your body It's done chewing the food. It's done swallowing the food. You have to figure out a way to get it down. So I would, it would take me two hours to get through a plate of food sometimes. So I would have food in my mouth. I'd look like a chipmunk, right? Chew it as much as I could. And sip water to help get it down. And I sip water to help get it down. But don't drink water while you're eating because you'll get full. You have to eat all the food, you know. Uh, The worst thing I I ate was a um, almond butter. Raw honey, peanut butter on toast. I'm, I'm sorry, banana on toast. Raw uh, almond butter, raw honey, banana on toast. That was the worst thing I ate. It's the driest thing you ever put in your mouth. Try it. You think it's nice. I can see it in your face. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I can assure you I'm smiling because uh, uh, your description was so uh, you know, vivid. Not because it sounds good. Uh, I think I've seen the light. I think I, I think I'm probably out on that diet, to be honest with you. And I'm really impressed, yeah. really impressed with you for being able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. At uh, at what point did it totally click for you, though? Like, I, I know at one point you, you spoke about finally being able to look in the mirror and see yourself as George Foreman. Um, I'd love to sort of hear you describe that moment for me as well. Um, I don't know. I, I was gaining the weight, you know, because it was coming on rather quickly. I mean, we're talking about uh, 10 pounds per week, you know, and um, as I'm gaining the weight, I'm I'm looking at myself change. So I'm still going into the gym, you know, I still got to put my clothes on. My clothes are fitting in ways that I've, I've never felt before. You know, my pants, I mean, my thighs were getting so big, you know, and it started to freak me out. And, uh, I was looking in the mirror and I was day after day, I started to feel like sad, man, you know, like depressed about myself. And one day, man, I just cut my hair off. I said, you know what? Forget it, man. I just cut my hair off. Had the baldy in the mirror. I cut my beard off and I just took my shirt off and I stood in the mirror and I looked at myself and I finally could see what all the work was for. I could finally see my interpretation of Mr. Foreman coming to fruition. So at that moment, man, it was like every single calorie that I had eaten and every single calorie that I was going to eat was worth it because I couldn't believe it. My belly was so big. You know, my chest and my shoulders and my arms were getting huge, man. My neck was getting fat, you know. Uh, what did they call it? A thumb neck. I started to have a thumb neck, you know, uh, like Kurt Angle, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it was, it was, it was an incredible moment for me. And that was the turning point. And to be honest, you know, my coach, Daryl Foster, was there with me. And and he was able to see that process happen, too. So every day I went into the gym, 
his confirmation on what was happening was also helpful for me and my spirit too in this time. How early in the process did you meet with George uh, himself face to face? And and how did sort of actually, you know, getting in touch with him and, and maybe any other legendary boxers that you spoke to to help shape this portrayal? How, how did that sort of change the trajectory of, of your performance? Um, tremendously. I had done a lot of research on him. I had watched as much film on him as I could, as, as I could find. I had read all of his autobiographies. But there was still something missing, right? It was like this the human element of George Foreman that was missing that we didn't have. But that's the story we're telling, right? We're not telling a, a story of a bunch of interviews. We're telling the story of a human being, an individual man, his experience. So I was like, I called Sony and was like, hey, I want to meet him. I need to meet him. And um, we had got together and they, they sent me down there for a few days to meet him in uh, Houston. And in those three days, what I saw, what I was able to observe and extract from him was so key. I can't tell you how excited I was on that third day after I got back to my hotel room and I started to listen to the audio. I started to watch the videos and then I started to jot down things that he had told me. I started to jot down the little nuances that I had seen him do day by day by day. Man, I was so excited because I felt like that was the missing piece. That was finally... The puzzle had come together in my mind and I understood what I was going to do, but I still had to learn because I still didn't know what it was like to be in the ring with a heavyweight fighter. That came later. It, that is That hits on something I've been wondering as well because there is something about you know, the, the real man story, of course, like you, you mm -hmm. get face to face with him, you learn more about him, but there is something about embodying a boxer that must be so, uh, you know, like life affirming, confidence inducing for an actor. Um, at what, what point did you sort of did that sort of click? Like when you was it when you got in the ring that you sort of got that feeling of, you know, mm. somewhat invincibility? No. So the thing about the thing about it is that and I'm, a lot of, a lot of times a lot of a lot of actors have played boxers before, you know, um, and that we can do, you know, um, but with this role in particular, I had Daryl Foster as a coach and he said, Chris, we're not gonna treat this like you're training for a film. We're gonna treat this like you're training for a heavyweight title fight. I didn't understand this. You know, I thought, okay, we do some punches. We learn some choreography. We'll get in there. We'll do the choreography, the fight choreography together, the stunts. This wasn't it at all. So we end up sparring. Oh, to my surprise, <laughs> right? I'm actually getting bopped in the face. Wow. Okay, here we go, right? Let's get rolling. Uh, so the turning point for me and the invincibility that you're talking about didn't come until much later, but when we were filming. But the turning point for me was when Cedric Boswell, former heavyweight fighter, 36 and 2, showed up, he played Sonny Liston, he showed up, and we started working together. The way that he understood physicality in the ring, he couldn't turn it down, right? He's not an actor, and he's not some guy who just goes to the gym to work out. We're talking about heavyweight champ, 36-2, okay? He fights different, even when he's not really fighting. He does something different, and my body, I knew then what Mr. Foreman was struggling with. He was doing things, little tricks in the ring. He, I remember one time I went to go throw a jab, a one shot, and I went to throw it, and he caught it like this, just, just something like that. Caught it, grabbed my arm, locked it in, yanked me down, and started giving me body shots, whipped me around. It was the wildest thing I'd ever felt in my life. But at that moment, I was like, okay, now I know what Mr. Foreman was feeling in the ring. So the turning point, and I don't think I would have gotten this type of this type of feeling like, okay. Now I know how to fight. Now I know what I'm doing if this hadn't happened. We had to film the Sonny Liston fight in two hours, right? The director wanted half a day. We had to do it in two hours. We don't got a lot of time. We don't got a lot of time to do a bunch of setups. So to grab the camera, got into the ring. Coach said, hey, y'all are going to have to go get it. So me and Cedric, we put on our headgear, we put on our, uh, our, um, our belts, you know what I mean? We put on our gloves, and we start open sparring. We sparred, open sparred. 
like three minute rounds, four rounds. After that, and I survived, I knew that, okay, I had just crossed the threshold and I really understood what this fight stuff is all about, what it's like to get into the ring and just open spar with a heavyweight champ, you know? So every fight after that, I brought that, that energy. I brought the energy. Don't don't walk up in that thing, you know, like we're going to be drinking lattes after this take. You know what I mean? <laughs> because I'm coming with the heat because I wanted to get it right. I now understood why Mr. Foreman's jab was so hard. If you got to get a guy like Cedric Boswell off of you, okay, that thing better be coming like a light pole because Cedric Boswell is going to keep coming. You want to put a guy like Cedric Boswell down? Your uppercut better be devastating because that guy is going to kill you. You know what I mean? So that was the turning point for me. Yeah, that's so impressive to hear, um, especially because I know you, you know your past year or so, you've, you've got this role, which shows one side of realized potential. You also worked in this incredible performance of in, in Death of a Salesman, where you're, you know, you're working mm -hmm. with Wendell Pierce and and you're sort of yeah. embodying the other side of, of potential and, and seeing what could happen to, <laughs> to somebody who, yeah. you know, <clears throat> starts off in, in one way and ends up somewhere else. How did you manage to marry those two roles and motivations together? Like how, how did one performance affect the other? Um, you know, if I'm going to be honest, the challenge was making them distinctly different. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I, could not go into Death of a Salesman with Big George Foreman on my mind, in my body, in my energy. So during the rehearsal process, it was a complete deconstruction of all the work that I had done for almost two years on Big George Foreman and having to start fresh midway through the rehearsal process. So I had to clear my mind and my spirit of everything that I had done before to step into this role and to embody and take on the different nuances and challenges that 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 play had i mean but that play required a different understanding of potential right we're talking about the father-son relationship we're talking about which was is, is essentially the central uh uh key uh point to the fi uh, film see that's what there i go to the play <laughs> right it's the father-son relationship you know and um digging into that i had to find a whole different bag of emotional integrity you know um for biff you know uh, the things that i relied on for big joy foreman could not have carried me through this you know uh so very different one did not inform the other they required uh different parts of me and um because i had to make the shift so quickly i gotta be honest with you playing biff playing biff took me out man that was one of the hardest plays I've ever done in my life uh, because I went into it with the same energy too. I wanted to get it right. And what's similar is, right, you got Mr. Foreman's legacy, right, that everyone knows. You got to get that right. So you got to be very intentional and specific about what's right. Death of a salesman. Everyone knows this play. Everybody knows Biff. I'm the first black, first black man to play Biff on Broadway. That's a huge possibility. I got to get that right, you know? So that's what they had in common. So being thorough to the very last moment on stage was key for me. So the, the throughout the entire process, I was continuing to study, continuing to unpack my character's wants, desires, X, Y, and Z, you know? Uh, yeah. I don't know if I answered that question, but it's kind of difficult to describe how difficult they both were and how incredibly different they both are and what it takes to make that shift so quickly. No, that's, that's an amazing answer and, and definitely gives me insight into the impossibly hard task that you had. And uh, Chris, I, I can't thank you enough for spending time with me today. And I can't wait to see that hard work on screen and big George Foreman. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, thank you so, so much for your time and, and for your amazing performances. Word. Thank you. Thank you, man, for talking to me.